We've got a first for both Ohio State and Michigan this spring, and we got to talk about what Coach Prime has had to say about M home visits and Shadour Sanders and Travis Hunter and their NFL futures. Let's go. It's the number one college football show. What's up, kids, folks? Welcome to the number one college football show. I am your host, RJ Young. Thank you for watching on the Fox Sports app, YouTube, or listening wherever you get your podcast. Today on the show, we got to talk about Ohio State and Michigan and first for them as we head into this raucous and loud spring football period. Also want to talk a little bit about Deion Sanders. Also want to pour one out for some homies. Well, I don't want to say pour one out because that that seems like I'm RIP and I'm not. I'm saying kudos to the Bassmaster Classic and the folks at Bass who had me out there. Tulsa, 107,000 people showing up. Got to see Justin Hamner win a world championship. That's a lot of fun. I had never been bass fishing before, but I think I'm going to have to go now as I had a great time on a boat with Ross Chastain, Logan Parker, and the like. Uh, probably writing more about this. One of my favorite features of the year so far. Check that out on Fox Sports and Fox Sports app. But first, let's go back to uh, well, first, let's second, let's get back to college football. In that, I thought it was interesting that Deion Sanders said Shadur and Travis Hunter won't play for some NFL teams. This is as it should be. I don't, I don't know why we're upset about this. This is exactly what it should happen. This is how it should happen. This is what it should be. Now, why would Coach Prime say this right now is a very good question. I answer this by saying the NFL draft is a month away and both Shadour Sanders and Travis Hunter are going to be eligible for said NFL draft in 2025. They're going into an all important year for them and Colorado as they embark on their, well, getting back to the big 12 and hope to compete for a big 12 title. But after going four and eight, we're still talking about this Colorado football team and y'all still give a damn about what Travis Hunter, Shadour Sanders are doing and what coach prime chooses to say about them. I don't get why you would expect folks with leverage not to use their leverage in where they would like to have their professional futures. To wit, if somebody gave you the option of doing your job in a sunny and nice place versus a wintry and let's say dark place, what would you choose? And that's about personal preference, right? If you're from Canada, you probably want to go up there where there's some hockey. Right. If you're from Florida, like prime, you want to go somewhere where it ain't going to be cold. Now, that said, right, I think that there are some franchises for which he would be very happy about Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter ending up, say, I don't know, the Atlanta Falcons, the Dallas Cowboys, San Francisco 49ers, or all three places that Coach Prime played and places where he knows that these two players could thrive. Now, what will this do to their draft stock? Will it help or hurt? To which I say it ain't it doesn't really matter. It it don't it doesn't matter. I wrote about this last week at Fox Sports and on the Fox Sports app, and you should go check that out. But the point to raise here is Shadur Sanders is in the conversation right now for QB1 in 2025. Other guys in that conversation include Quinn Ewers, Jalen Milrow. I keep going down the line, but I'm not going to because you get the point here. Okay. We already know that he's good. The numbers that he put up at Jackson State are the same numbers he put up at Colorado in year one, setting the school record for passing. And he didn't even play 12 games last year. He played 11. And his offensive line was paper mache. Okay? We're not even going to name them dudes because they got that man sacked 50-plus times and got a fractured back for him. So he's coming back from that. So that might be the only thing that I'm really interested in is what does he look like throwing a football? And then how does he look throwing a football this year with Phil Lodeholt running the offensive line and five-star Jordan Seaton? Probably going to start at left tackle as a true freshman. As for Travis Hunter, the question is whether or not that dude's going to go both ways. And I think that's really going to be up to him and Coach Prime. The way I look at this is Coach Prime has had so much to say and such a heavy hand in what Travis Hunter does when doesn't do. That is not to say that he is acting like that dude's daddy, but it wouldn't surprise me to find out that Hunter is the first and last opinion Uh that matters, but also the coach prime's taking up all the space in the middle of that, right? So if we're thinking about this in as far as what the draft stock is, if Shadour Sanders goes for 4,500 yards and 40 plus TDs, it's probably going to put him in the conversation for QB1, right? Not unlike Drake May versus Caleb Williams right now. 
I think with Travis, it's about is he going to be playing wide receiver predominantly? Is he going to be playing defensive back predominantly? Does he want to play both? And, you know, Prime could do both. He was that kind of player, and Prime believes that Hunter is that kind of player. We'll see about how that goes in the NFL because the NFL really does value the health of its players above all. So playing 100 snaps is probably not in the cards for Travis Hunter, no matter how good he is at playing both positions. But getting back to Prime saying that both Shador and Travis, and they say nothing to Shiloh, who's a good player but probably doesn't have this much leverage, are going to go – or hold out for where they want to go, albeit sunny, right? Maybe a place that might be like Houston, might be like Dallas, somewhere close to home. I think you got to take a look at this the way that Prime went through the NFL draft in 1989. So Prime was selected fifth overall in 1989 by the Atlanta Falcons. But it was after he played a year as a walk-on at Florida State. Same year, he won the Thorpe Award as a walk-on. And the reason I keep saying he's a walk-on is because he signed a contract with the New York Yankees that made him ineligible for scholarship at Florida State, but it didn't matter. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite stories from his first book way back when is Coach Bobby Bowden going around the room during what would be Prime's last year in college football and asking players, why am I getting reports that y'all aren't going to class? Raise your hand. If you have not been going to class, for which Prime was the first and only hand to go up in the air. And Bobby Bowden had to say, hey, that doesn't matter because that dude, he's over here on his own. He was only here to play football because he knew he was getting drafted the very next year. And not only that, Prime refused to take meetings with people that weren't going to select inside the top 10. Like, uh-uh, no, I'm going to be golf for that. Why would I take a meeting with you? That is how his get down has been from the very beginning. And he has kept that get down after 14 years in the league, uh, an illustrious career in TV, and now building a resume as a pretty outstanding college football coach. It's also about leverage and privilege. So Prime could have refused to play for, let's say, for the sake of argument, and pick a Northeastern team like the New England Patriots, who apparently have some kind of feelings about how a documentary about them has gone like documentaries that are good do go right. They show us your laundry. They show us what you don't want us to know about. If he'd end up at being selected by, let's say the new England Patriots, then would he have held out? Probably he didn't need the money. He didn't have to play football. He was already a New York Yankee and he was already making a ton of money from marketing opportunities. The man bought a five speed transmission car without knowing how to drive a manual because he could just do that. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of y'all that can't drive a manual, but it ain't because you bought a manual car. It's, you know, because you, well, my car is millennial proof as I'm a millennial. I'm just going to throw that out there because it's got a five-speed transmission in there. I got to use a clutch and all of this, right? I'm saying point here is that both Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter have the same opportunities here. They don't have to sign with whoever selects them. They could, they might. I dare say they should because that's millions of dollars you leaving out there. And, you know, everybody wants to get behind you. That said, we've seen this before. And I'm tired of people acting as if Prime came up with this because he did not come up with a lot of things. But he did not come up with the idea of saying, I won't play for you. I will hold out. No, did that first time that we ever heard about John Elway coming out of that Ivy League in the West Coast who said, I'm not playing for the Baltimore Colts. I would sooner play baseball for the New York friggin' Yankees. And you know what happened? He ended up playing for the Denver Broncos. You know what happened when he got to Denver Broncos? He won two Super Bowls, all right? 2004, 19 years later, 21 years later, math, RJ, I'm an English major, math. 21 years later, we get to see Eli Manning and the Mannings, the first family of football, says, hey, I know that I'm coming out of the SIP. I know that I'm coming out of Ole Miss, ain't, which ain't won nothing ever period, just telling it like it is, who said, I'm not playing for the then San Diego Chargers. It will not happen. Y'all can take me, but you're going to be wasting a pick because I will just sit here on my hands rather than play football for you. What happened? 45 minutes before draft start, they trade that pick to the New York Giants. Chargers go and take Phillip Rivers. Turns out to be pretty good for them because Phillip Rivers had a pretty damn good career in the NFL. But you know what the Giants got? Two Super Bowls out of Eli Manning. 
And when he goes in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and he will, he's going in as a giant, right? Not bad for a guy that held out. Now we're getting back around to a couple players already saying, hey, look, there are some of y'all that we simply don't want to play for. Now, I think it is smart not to name names in all of this. But the point to be raised is you care that Coach Prime says 13 months before either one of these players is going to be selected where they may or may not be playing before they have finished their college football careers. I still marvel at just how much people show up to hear what Prime has to say and to see what these players are doing. I don't think it is a coincidence that Shador Sanders shows up from Jackson State to Colorado, a team that has won a national championship but ain't got that much more claims than Ole Miss. You get what I'm saying here? And he has the best-selling jersey in college football in 2023. As a matter of fact, the only athlete in college sports to outsell Shador Sanders in jerseys is Caitlin Clark. And many people would tell you she is in another stratosphere. And as far as what her superstardom can bring her and the University of Iowa to say nothing of what it's meaning for the Iowa Hawkeyes to be on a run, we hope with a collision course with South Carolina in some capacity because that's just going to be outstanding. I mean, what Don Staley and them Gamecocks is doing is ridiculous. What Caitlin Clark has been doing is ridiculous. I would think we would all like to see that game played. I'd also add here. None of the quarterbacks that I mentioned here, John Elway, nor Eli Manning, needed the money. Shadour Sanders does not need money. Travis Hunter bought his mama a house, and he is fine, right? Another dude that is country like you read about, but got his bread correct. I think talking about him this way is kind of like talking about what Caleb Williams was doing when, you know, can we get an ownership share? from the team that wants to select him, to which the owner goes, absolutely not, right? And you get this, and I get this. But that he's asking, you understand, this is where we are. It's not player empowerment, right? I think people are using that phrase incorrectly, and I think they've been using it incorrectly for some time. It doesn't necessarily make a place like the NBA, for instance, better, but it does make sure that we are paying attention to what they have to say, right? Turns out LeBron James, like the rest of us, he starts podcasts and all of a sudden he wants us to listen. It's the same difference, right? Can you say it at a time when people care and what's going on? So Prime is saying all this in March when people are just starting up with spring football and famously are not marketing to their audience. I'm always astounded at how football coaches don't want to tell media or fans a damn thing about what they are doing in the spring as if it's really going to show up in the fall. And if it does, why are you afraid of this? Coach Switzer used to practice Oklahoma in front of Nebraska. Say, we know what we're running. We know what you're running. Bring it. Coach Switzer also understood media. Showed up to recruit Marcus Dupree in a fur coat in Mississippi. Philadelphia, Mississippi, where it's hot and it's humid. But he knew what that coat was going to do. Prime is in the same way, right? I also think that we should probably take this conversation back to college football just a little bit. I always kind of get my feelings around NFL draft time because it feels like there's a whole bunch of people that are being introduced to our players in a way that I'm like, you should have known about these folks for at least two years, if not three. I don't need, I shouldn't be even telling you about who Caleb Williams is or who Drake May is or who Jaden Daniels is. You should know, right? But we always got to start over and re-educate these folks that don't give a damn about our sport except to say we're going to mine it for the young talent. But that is also sort of changing. Because we're becoming, once again, a monolithic culture, right? It's getting more difficult to break through. Yet Prime has broken through once again. Because Deion Sanders might have just killed the in-home visit. And he's right to have killed the in-home visit for him and for coaches like him. Now, while I don't agree that parents don't want him in their homes, he would say, He didn't want Bobby Bowden, when he was being recruited to Florida State, to show up at his house because rats and roaches might have been out early in the morning, and he didn't want to show all that out. He didn't want to put his mama on front street like that. Probably has a lot of parents that are like that when he goes to visit, let's say, ostensibly to visit high school football recruits. To which, 
I think I speak for many of us when I say we would all like Coach Prime to come up to our house and have his way in. And if we thought it was in some sort of disarray, well, hell, we're going to call the pest control. We're going to put the quick shine down on the hardwood. We're going to hit the light saw and the bleach with anything that looks suspicious. And we're going to make it do what it do, right? The in-home visit is about tradition. It's also about a time when we didn't get to see college football as much as we did today, right? It's about not knowing who these recruits are and them not knowing the coaches. It's about showing up there, having dinner with a family and trying to figure out who the hell it is that you offered and whether or not they can do the job. Now that said, I also know that there are some coaches out there who feel some kind of way about Deion Sanders saying, I'm not doing no in-home visits. Y'all got to come to me. And he wants to show off the university. Now that's the way to spin it, right? The way to spin it is to say, we have this magnificent university in Boulder. Come experience it with us. It's my home. And I think you would like to see how my house is kept rather than how your house is kept, because this is where they're going to spend the bulk of their time, them being your sons. I also think that the juice ain't worth the squeeze for a guy like Prime, because I mentioned this last week in the show, but there is no other football coach in FBS who gets late night and CBS mornings in the same week, randomly in March because he got a book coming out. But Prime did. He showed up on Jimmy Fallon. He showed up getting interviewed by Nate Burleson. He went on the Today Show to talk about being a granddaddy. Okay? Kirby Smart hasn't done that. Lincoln Riley hasn't done that. Ryan Day hasn't done that. Prime has done that. There are lots of coaches who don't rate with Lincoln Riley, Ryan Day, Dan Lanning, Kirby Smart, who have feelings about this, to which I'm going, hey, dog, welcome to the United States of America where we value talent and we value acclaim and we will treat you differently if you have demonstrated yourself to be a cut above. And that is what Prime has done. I also think that when you're looking at his roster, he's been very clear about this since he got into the sport. He wants 40% graduate transfers, 40% transfers, and 20% from high school, which is another way of saying he ain't really going on no in-home visits for high school recruits, and he ain't got time to go on no in-home visits for transfers. You want to come to here. You want to play here. They will have their camps for transfers in May. Those guys will show up in Boulder to work out. Whether or not they get offered, we'll see. I think there's also, you know, Kirby Smart will do in-home visits. Ryan Day will do in-home visits. But that's because that's how they know how to do this. This breaking the mold with what we come to know of as tradition has been Prime's get down from the jump. He built a roster mostly out of transfers in 2023. Now, did it work? Not really. They went four and eight, but it's also year one, right? I'm thinking about this from the standpoint of you get to have such turnover on your roster that year to year, the only thing that has to be constant is you. And Prime has, if nothing else, been constant. As we have been rotating around college football and what it's going to be and how it's going to go, and we have moved the transfer window back, we have changed the transfer window, we have moved early signing period to be ahead of the transfer window, we have expanded the college football playoff, we're going to have to change the way that we look at non-conference games. Prime has said, nah, I'm, I'm going to do what I do. Y'all do what y'all do. And I think he's right to feel some kind of way about people taking shots at him for minding his own, right? He's not out here telling you how to do your business. Why do you care how he does his? And I think that has more to do with how individuals feel about Coach Prime as opposed to what that program has come to represent. For instance, and I'm going to say this again because I still can't believe that this was true, but it is. We got a vice chancellor of admissions at Colorado that did not seem to think that Deion Sanders had anything to do with their record number of applicants to the University of Colorado following his hire. That's where we're at right now. And if I got to keep explaining that to folks that don't get it, we're not going to get very far. Or at least I'm going to keep going. You're going to keep going. And we're going to have to leave those folks behind because they don't understand what it means in college football to have a guy like Prime who can break through in this monolithic culture. Now, that said, if Kirby Smart decided he's no longer doing in-home visits, if Brent Venables decided he's no longer doing in-home visits, Ryan Day, Dan Lanning, Lincoln Riley, I don't think we would lose anything. And I don't think that the players and recruits would lose anything either, nor the parents, because you come out on your visits anyway. And now that we have basically made law you can pay a recruit to come to your university just to 
camp out for a while and not actually have to sign a national letter of intent or a financial aid agreement as part of getting this money, why the hell would they want you to come to their house in the first place? No, no, no. We'll take your money and go there on an all expenses paid trip to wherever, right? Whether it be Columbus or Boulder or Norman. I think this is going to become the way that we do business. And I think because Prime was brave enough to say this is how he does business, a lot of people are taking shots at them while others are taking notes. And you should take notes too, because I think this is going to continue to be a big deal, right? I, I, I think that it is important to also note that it's not just coaches and players that have to come to Prime or recruits that have to come to Prime or families that have to come to Prime. You know who else had to come to Prime? ESPN. You know who else had to come to Prime? Fox. We all have to go to Boulder if we want some of him. And he has recognized that and leveraged that into more opportunities for his players and his staff. Goodness me, man. What are we arguing about here? Speaking of more opportunities for your players and your staff, Ohio State and Michigan are going to have first in April of this year. For the first time, they're going to have their spring games nationally televised on Big Fox. Those games taking place April 13th, April 20th, in the middle of the UFL schedule, which we'll talk about on Thursday. But I want to take apart both of these spring games, really, and talk about why I'm excited about them. First, being on national television is nothing to thumb your nose at. And shout out to the bosses at Fox who saw ESPN and what they'd done for Jackson State, Colorado, is going, well, we got that right now, especially with two enormous names in the sport and the two programs that have run the Big Ten as you have new entrants into the Big Ten in the form of USC, Washington, Oregon, and UCLA. I think it is important that Ohio State and Michigan get to be on a national stage and really get to remind people, yeah, we have run this conference for the better part of, well, ever, right? It's It's been theirs. They've traded who is actually the champ. But I challenge you to name the last time that a team not named Ohio State or Michigan won the Big Ten championship in football. Okay? That's what we're talking about when you get to play your spring game on Big Fox in April. Now, let's zero in on Ohio State for just a second here because top line here, this is the most exciting, if not the most talented roster in football. I am salivating at the thought of what this program might be able to do in 2024, given its star power. Julian Salen and Aaron Nolan, I want to see take snaps during the spring game, and I want to see them throw the ball around. I don't want to see them take snaps and hand the ball to no tailback, okay? I'm going to get enough of Dallin Hayden. I don't need that. I need Julian Salen slinging it. Run four verticals. Let's see what you got, right? Put Aaron Nolan in the floods package or in levels concepts, and let me see them rip it around. And I want to see them rip it around because I'm so jealous of this staff and this <laughs> the folks that play and recruit to go Ohio State because you get to watch Caleb Downs and Jeremiah Smith go one-on-one all year. All, all, all year. I think Caleb Downs is the best defensive back in football. He lost his black stripe earlier today, by the way. So all the folks that think he's returning to Alabama, well, he blooded over at Columbus now. That's, that's just not happening, right? And then Jeremiah Smith is absolutely turning heads at practice, man. Like, the way that folks are talking about him ought to terrify everybody else. He's a true freshman. You know, he's a true freshman that Brandon Ennis is telling anybody that will listen. Somehow, some way, that dude got to get on the football field. What he can do is ridiculous. And then I remember it's not just Jeremiah Smith and Brandon Ennis. It's also Mega Ibuka who is going to be leading that receiving core, right? It, It's Carnell Tate. Like, they're going to be legitimately awesome again at wide receiver. And they've got options. And I'm talking about the two freshmen that I want to see sling the rock because I know what kind of a quarterback Will Howard is. The kind that can lead Kansas State to not just a Big 12 championship, but knock off undefeated Texas Christian who played in the national championship game just two years ago. Okay. Then I get to see Ryan day on a sideline without having to look at a play card for the first time. Like ever. I doubt that the man is actually going to have to consult his play card at all because his mentor 
his coach in college. Chip Kelly is running the offense, and we all know what Chip Kelly is capable of as an offensive play caller. Give him the toys that are this quarterback room, which is ridiculous, that wide receiver room, which is ridiculous, Quinshawn Judkins, Travion Henderson, and Dallin Hayden, which is ridiculous, and an offensive line that feels like he can put it all together this year. That's going to be so much fun. They might average 50 a game. That's what they're capable of doing. Defensively, they could be just as good as they were last year. And remember, the Ohio State defense carried Ohio State all year long. It was not an offense that operated to the level that we have come to expect from Ryan Day, which is another way in which he's acknowledging, hey, being the head coach is taking a lot more out of me, and the offense is not going as well as it should. So I'm going to hand over those controls. Meanwhile, Jim Knowles is like, no, nah, I got it on defense. It's cool. I got Denzel Burks coming back. I got Lathan Ransom. You know, I got C.J. Hicks dropping down. We'll see where Sonny Styles actually plays. I realize that there's a number of Ohio State fans that believe in Sonny Styles just playing linebacker. You might well be right, but I would be shocked if I don't see him in some safety packages. Six foot four, 230. There's a lot he can do. He can play at all three levels. He can come off the edge if you want him to, right? He gives you a versatile player. And then you got Larry Johnson Sr., who's one of the 40 highest paid coaches, period, regardless of title, in the sport, who has said out loud, look, guys, I'm not leaving. I'm chasing greatness. I want to win championships. I'm not chasing a paycheck. I'm fine. And he's got two outstanding ends in Jack Sawyer and JT Tuimolau that can get after folks. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm telling y'all, I have never been more excited about an Ohio State football season, not just because this roster, but because I know Ryan Day got to have it November 30th. He has to win that game. And in winning that game, probably not just punches a ticket to the Big Ten championship game because, well, Ohio State and Michigan have run this conference, but gives Ohio State the best shot it has had since 2020 to win a national championship, and that is what they're chasing in Columbus. Meanwhile, that team up north, they get it done. So I'm so excited about that spring game because I want to see Michigan fans on their nods. I want to see you on your, you can hate me now, okay? I want to see y'all absolutely putting on the black hat and saying, no, hate us. We the champs. Act like the champs, right? Act like y'all been here. And I want to see this place that can hold 110,000 people in the big house full. I mean, y'all ain't got no excuse. Y'all the reigning national champs, running college football. Hell, the Detroit Lions are good. Y'all got every reason to pack that spring game. And I'm going to be very upset right here on this show if Michigan does not lead the nation in attendance for spring games. And you know how much we care about attendance for these free exhibitions. These glorified practices. But you know what? Y'all better pack it in. Y'all better act like it. Y'all better absolutely embrace this. You're going into a historic year where you could see more players drafted from one team than any other team in the entire history of the sport to the NFL. It's not small. I need y'all to step up. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to give me the business in the comments? That's fine. Go, 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 go do that. Hit me on the tweets, right? RJ didn't rank us in 2021. Sure. RJ didn't rank us in 2022 in the preseason. Sure. But now, step up. You know, be be the Michigan men that y'all claim to be, right? And women, right? Be that. Let me see. Let me hear James Earl Jones coming out to speakers. You better have him in the kickers knocking like he in the trunk. I have never wanted to see this team absolutely blaring hail to the victors loud enough for them to hear in Columbus more. Okay? I need y'all to be big on your energy, okay? Meanwhile, on the field, apart from what I want to see for fans, Wink Martindale might be out here fixing what ain't broken. I don't know how to feel about this because the defense that Michigan ran with Mike McDonald and with Jesse Minter is the one that Wink Martindale made famous at Baltimore, okay? It's his defense. But he's out here saying things like, Hey, we're going to do whatever we got to do to win football games. That means rush three, we'll rush three. If that means bring an eight, we'll bring eight. I'm going, hey, no, 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 no. This Michigan program has had a very defined defensive philosophy on this run dating back to 2021. And it is being sound 
and it is playing complimentary football. But, you know, Wink Martindale might actually be talking to media like, well, almost everybody else talks to media, which is not to want to reveal anything about what the scheme is, to which I'm going, hey, man, do something. Tell us anything. But his quote that he gave the Michigan Insider was, I'm not going to tell Ryan Day or Sark, Steve Sarkeesian, what we're going to do. First of all, the game with Ohio State is in November. It's November 30th. You got a lot of other games you got to play between now and then. You're going to have some injuries. Talk about one that's significant here in a bit. The other one is, you think Steve Sarkeesian gives a damn what you're running in, in March and April? I wouldn't. We're going to run what we run. You're going to run what you run. Let's see if we can't make it do what it do, right? Can't wait for Texas to go up there to Michigan. That's going to be a lot of fun. But the only thing that I think they can agree on among the players when they talk to media is that the scheme is different. Like, there was this really interesting exchange between a couple of these Michigan players, one of them, uh, Mason Graham, where they were talking to media, and they were like, hey, look, this defense is different. Like, we're doing some things we never done. And media was cynical, going, all right, you don't have to tell us no lies. Like, wh why? Like, are you just trying to throw us off the scent? And they're going, no, it's legitimately different than anything we have done, for which I'm raising my eyebrow I'm going, why are you fixing what isn't broken? So it's, it's a rule working on cars, right? Don't look for stuff to fix. Leave that alone. Don't wait for, wait for that to break. Because if you go trying to fix stuff, other thing is going to break. And I feel like that is what we're looking at. And perhaps there's some conclusions to draw from that because news surfaced on Monday, that Rod Moore, a three-year starter for Michigan uh, at safety, had blown out his ACL in practice. That means nine of your 11 starters on that defense are basically going to start, if nothing else, on the shelf in Rod Moore's case in 2024, but also you're just going to have to replace that production. Can you do it, right? Like Kenneth Grant, awesome. Mason Graham, Awesome, but you need nine other dudes that can absolutely get it uh, get it done out there, along with Will Johnson in that secondary, so forth, so on. I'm curious to see who steps up, because Rod Moore made a big play, a couple big plays against Ohio State in the game, and he was playing with a chip on his shoulder. Like that was a dude that very much wanted everybody to know Michigan wanted me, and Ohio State didn't, and acted like it. Where's that energy going to come from? Where's the Mike Sainer still on this defense? And that's before we start talking about the offense, for which. Be curious to find out if Sharon Moore continues to call plays or if he actually hands those over to Kirk Campbell, right? It's saying one thing in the spring and doing something else in the fall. We'll see. But you got these 15 practices where I believe they should be used to try to find out who your starting quarterback is going to be. J.J. McCarthy's out the door. Kirk Campbell, his quarterback's coach, has become his offensive coordinator. But then you got Kirk Campbell out here talking about we ain't got a starter in the QB room because – well, everyone's a number one. No, 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 they're not, Kirk. No, 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 they're not. Not everybody can be a number one. That's why we call it number one. You got Alex Origi, Jane Denagle, Davis Warren, and Jaden Davis competing for that spot. But I'm going to make it simple. Okay? Since you don't want to tell us who the starter is, I'm going to tell you that it's Alex Origi. Okay? That's a guy who has been in the program, understands the system, and also has snaps playing significant football in the national championship game. Quiet as it is kept, Sharon Moore has been really smart about getting J.J. McCarthy when he was backing up K. McNamara into the game. Also smart about getting Alex Origi into the game in 2023, so much so that we're going, nah, now ain't the time for the backups to play. Hey, I want to play. I'm on a bench. I ain't play. Let me play. But that is setting them up, right? I go back to something that actually Ryan Day admitted couple years back when it was clear to him that C.J. Stroud and Jack Miller, who were competing for the starting job at the time, had not thrown a pass in the previous season. He's going, I got to do better on that. I got to make sure the guys play. The next year, Kyle McCord started, played all against Akron, right? He got the reps that he needed in that, well, pay guarantee game. I think you have set Alex up to be the guy going in 2024. Let's not complicate this and take all of the emotion out of this decision coming in August. If you can get through the spring and announce that guy, announce that guy. Let the team rally around him. Let him know it's his going into week one and make it happen, right? Give him enough room to make some mistakes between now and then as opposed to, all right, it's your turn. Go do that. I hated that. I've always hated that. When somebody walks up to you a few minutes before and says, okay, you're the starter, 
Man, they're talking about get your mind right. In five minutes, in five hours, in five days? No, no. I get being ready, and we all want to be ready, but you owe it to these players to give them the best opportunity to be ready when it's time to play. Give them time to ramp up. That's what I'm asking for for Alex Origi. Last thing I think is important about this Michigan spring period as they get set to play on national television for the first time, Tony Alford could be the best thing that ever happened to Donovan Edwards. I realize that there are Ohio State fans that feel some kind of way about that statement, but understand, Donovan Edwards is going to be RB1, right? Tony Alford know, knew this before he got to Ann Arbor. We all knew it, right? There is no controversy here. That said, you also know the offense that Sharon Moore runs is going to ask the tailback to do a lot of work. Blake Corum got worked out in 2022 and 2023. This while Donovan Edwards would show up in big game moments and have big games. Iowa won the Big Ten Championship 2022. Ohio State in 2022, right? This is a man that could break you off a little something, something, and has also been feeling himself the last couple of years. I understand it, right? But you're talking about a Donovan Edwards who could end up being RB1 in the NFL draft in 2025, provided he has a big year in 2024. And I think Alford showing up, right, on the exit of Mike Hart, is doing everything he can to make sure that happens because his record of producing tailbacks is also one that he would like to keep very high, right? I don't understand why he wouldn't, but you get my point here. I think that Donovan Edwards is going to learn a lot from Alford. I think Alford's going to learn a lot from being at Michigan about what it takes. And then he's obviously going to come in with a tremendous amount of knowledge of their most important foe, that is the Ohio State Buckeyes. If all of that works together the way that I think it can, there's no reason to believe that Donovan Edwards isn't a 1,500-yard back with 15, 20 touchdowns in 2024. And vaults back into that conversation, leading Michigan to what they hope is yet another Big Ten championship and, and perhaps an opportunity to defend their national championship. All right, that is going to do it for tonight's live episode of the number one college football show. We will be back on Thursday to set you up for the start of the UFL season and five players that I think franchises might be sleeping on ahead of the NFL draft. Our number one college football show lead of screening is Jack Cogley. Additional support from Kiara Santana and Jim Cunningham to put the special in our special teams. Producer Javion Duncan makes sure the recruits and the rivals see the cake we bake. Technical goal director Chaz Boulay sends in the signal. Senior producer Catherine Cordati sees the entire field from the roof. Lead producer Tyler Wojak calls the plays from the sideline. The play snaps on my clap. We'll see y'all back here on Thursday. Until then, stay low. Keep those feet driving. Doses.